you can find the best spot in the world, but you still have to go in there and have confidence and spend the time to kill these deer. It takes time. Going in there and not seeing him and knowing I haven't spooked him is almost just as good because I know eventually I'm, I'm getting closer. So the way that we were thinking about this episode is, man, if if we were going to write the book or if we were going to ask Drew to write the book on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments of deer hunting. Of, of Ozark Mountain buck hunting. Ozark Mountain buck hunting. Like what what would it be? What would the kind of the Ten Commandments be? And so that's kind of how we're framing up this episode. So we're going to, we talked with Drew. We, we've kind of got some points and we're just kind of going to work through the principles as we go through the episode and um and Drew's going to he's going to we're going to guide him but he's going to guide us in in every other way um and so before we get straight to the the commandments let's just start with Drew how long have you been hunting deer in the Ozarks and how how have you gotten the reputation that you've gotten I've been hunting them since I was like 6 7 years old probably killed my first one when I was 9 years old but it's kind of funny because I first started off dog hunting that was big around here back when it was legal believe it or not years ago and, uh, you know, lots of big bucks were killed, but the reason why people use dogs is because of this rough terrain, this ground, you couldn't, you know, really get on deer and get them out of that stuff. So I used dogs to hunt them back then, and <clears throat> I kind of progressed into, you know, steel hunting and slip hunting and then uh, eventually into bow hunting when I was, I don't know, probably 14, 15 years old. And uh, Dad, he didn't bow hunt. I actually got him into bow hunting. Really? Yeah. Took him up there to... Missouri, me and him went up, and the first year he bow hunted, he killed a, a 10 point that was close to Pope and Young here on the forest. And then he killed a, he was walking into my stand when he killed that deer. And then he killed <laughs> a 151 eight point in Missouri. No way. Yeah. That'll get you into bow hunting. That first year he picked <laughs> up a bow. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I started long before that. And, uh, you know, I've just been in the woods up here a lot. And, studied deer and experimented with different things and figured a lot of stuff out over the years. And the biggest thing I'll say, it's just, it's consistency and patience here in the mountains. It's just, you have to have the confidence too. And we're going to talk about that later, but it's, it's so big. It's not like, you know, hunting the Midwest where you're going to see a big buck multiple times. Right. You may only get to see the thing once or twice in a season if you're hunting, if you're hunting a particular deer. But yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I, you know, transitioned into it. I started, you know, hunting with dogs and then still hunting, slip hunting, and then transitioned into bow hunting. And then I even do some traditional hunting too now. I've killed several with a trad bow. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, my shoulder gets better. I want to get that thing back out and get after it. I was going to say, we, sh- we should probably say, because I know you just you just killed a buck the other night with the crossbow. Was mm-hmm. that your first crossbow? No, I've killed them killed- years ago. Okay. You know, when I was in that transition phase you go from you know so they got phases of hunters you know yeah i had a I had a phase there where i hunted with a crossbow okay i was kind of wondering about that i thought man it's been so long since i've killed one with a crossbow i don't even know if i'll get excited or not <laughs> the deer got me excited so <laughs> your he heart got, was beating yeah he got the arrow oh man i well so i was gonna say you're i know you just had shoulder surgery so you're you're not pulling back your compound right now so you're you're hunting with that crossbow yeah. climbing up a tree is probably a little bit harder than normal it's, yeah it's it's kind of tough yeah, I gotta make sure not stretch it out too much because I want it. I want it to heal so I can so I can pull that bow. Maybe in December, hopefully. Okay, gotcha. So there there's a timeline to recovery. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, I was gonna ask just in general. You kind of alluded to something there. Midwest versus Ozark. You know, a lot of people see guys hunting Kansas, hunting Iowa, hunting these big buck states in the Midwest. What makes it so much different and and more challenging is how I've always heard it. That may piss off a lot of Midwesterners, <laughs> but what makes hunting the Ozarks so much harder than you know hunting those ag fields and and up in Kansas and those big buck states? Well, I've hunted out there, and it it is easier. I'll just go on and I'll say that right now. <laughs> <clears throat> those deer act different too. I mean, they respond to calling. I mean, you don't you don't have to exactly be in the right spot. You know, if you're off a little bit, those deer are so aggressive. I mean, you can 
you know, a good percentage of them is going to come to a call, rattling or grunting and whatever you're going to do. But, uh, <clears throat> and the bedding is the other thing here. There's so many places they can bed. You can't identify an actual, you know, place where if you do, you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, it's, and these deer up here, it just seems like they're more jumpy and more spooky too. I don't know what it is. They're just, I, it may be a different subgroup. I don't know, but it's, they are so on edge all the time. And if you'll notice a lot of them that shoot with a bow, they don't run out there and stop and look around. They take off like an elk. They don't stop until they run out of air. Until they're dead. Yeah. Yep. yep. So yep. I've heard the I've heard the mountain deer. Well, and I've hunted them long enough too to know that they're described as a wily buck, which yeah. is different than an aggressive buck. And I know it sounds similar, but mm-hmm. they they just got an edge where it's they just I don't want, they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be known. They're yep. elusive. They're elusive. They're they, wily. It makes them a, a yes. big mountain deer a, a truly mm-hmm. spectacular critter yep and there's lots of good hunters up here in the mountains oh for sure yeah, and, and anybody that kills those mature deer they're they're good i just like to film mine that may be where people are seeing me because i'm getting mine on video right that's where i really wanted to i mean even if it's not a giant you know, like a high scoring deer if i've got a good video and it got my heart pounding then that's that's where i'm at with it yeah and you I'm put good, it on youtube right that. yeah I'm okay, what's on, your YouTube channel? It's Drew Atkinson Outdoors. There we go. I've got like 51 videos on there. I don't have that many videos. I don't. When did I start that, Lane, that channel? 2019? I think it was in 2019 when I started it. But I've, I've got lots of footage before that. I've been filming for a long time. Okay. And I've got it all on an old hard drive, and it actually kind of crashed on me the other day. I'm going to have to take Uh-oh. it in and see if I can get some stuff recovered. But oh, shoot. I had trail cameras from pictures from way back on it and all kinds of stuff, but <clears throat> lightning hit my computer and I put it on that hard drive, off my hard drive on my computer, and that was supposed to be like the best one. And mm-hmm. it kind of, it lasted, I think, maybe five years and then it just went down on me. But oh, all shoot. that stuff that I had, but I'm going to try to recover it and maybe put some of those hunts on yeah. later if I can recover it. Yeah, heck yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, <clears throat> Let's let's get into it. Um, if if we're talking about the Ten Commandments of of Ozark Mountain buck hunting, where would you start? What would be number one on like, man, this is number one. This is where you got to start every single time. Well, so if you're looking at it from the early season perspective, which is going to be opener, that's first. Mm-hmm. That's where I would start. It's going to be food, food for sure, and you know, preferred food. You just go out and look at the mass crops and see what they're feeding on. What they're feeding on in late summer sometimes is going to be different because when you start getting mass fall, just like the bear and everything else, they're going to disappear and fall back into the woods and uh, start eating acorns. And white oak, of course, it's number one. Most people know that. If you can find the white oaks early when they are not widespread but they're kind of spotty and they're patchy and they're only in certain areas, that's the best time to hunt early season if you can find an area that's got them or a certain level on the mountain that's got them mm-hmm. where it's kind of not, you know, just completely covering the whole mountainside or the whole, you know, area that you're hunting, drainage, watershed, however big of area it is. Those in, you're talking about individual trees versus kind of a, a range of several different trees, more like yeah. the spotty so you can kind of target one yeah. area. Yeah, there could be a bench. It might run a quarter of a mile, you know, at – 1400 foot elevation and it's got you know acorns all over it and you may get out on top and you may find nothing but hickory nuts you know Hmm. or you might not find anything at all i found a spot like that just about three weeks ago there's a hickory nuts on top and i had to go down two levels and then down a big steep and all of a sudden i just hit the awfulest wad of white oaks i mean they were just everywhere and below the bluff i don't know but i know that on that level there was definitely a change out there from what was on top there wasn't anything on top and i know those would have been dropping because they're on the same you know aspect sure and everything. so yeah that's kind of what i look for <clears throat> and i talked about it too on the the north slopes when you're hunting earlier they're cooler if it's really hot find a place that's got water and then uh, get in there and look at that first and see if there's food in there on those north facing slopes and then if there is then i'd you know, concentrate most of my time in there. And if there's not, then I'll move to the next side and start looking. Gotcha. So if it's real early, you want some, some shade, some water, and some food. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, they can, and the, the bedding, it's, 
it's kind of hard to find early because they bed pretty much anywhere. Mm-hmm. It's the foliage is on and they feel comfortable, you know, in a lot more areas than they will when the when the foliage falls off. It kind of opens things up more, and hunting pressure comes on, and uh, they start to move and change a little bit where they bed a little bit later when the leaves start falling. <clears throat> but early, yeah, you find those things, and then you can look for sign too. Those bucks, they make sign. I think even when they're in velvet, I've I've had pictures of bucks hitting scrapes when they're in velvet. I don't think they'll horn limbs or anything and damage their velvet, but they can still put saliva on licking branches. They can mm-hmm. put sand out of their, you know, pernorbital glands or whatever scent producing glands they've got, they can put sand out without horning an actual tree or working a limb with their horns. And then that transitions right on into uh, September and they start getting a little more aggressive in September with it. You'll start to see, you know, some bushes twisted when they start coming out of velvet. Some of that uh, sign where they're working their neck muscles and they're maybe a little bit of possibly, you know, this is my area type sign, you know. Right. They call it territorial sign. I could probably go along with that because I've seen a lot of aggressive sign early. And uh, that's what I look for, though, those twisted bushes. You you find those twisted and they're on the ground. You know, he's got tines and he's probably maybe, you know, probably more than two and a half year old. He could be a two and a half year old, but it's usually a more mature buck. But that's more significant when you find that sign early. Mm -hmm. When you find it early, that means you're probably pretty close because they don't make it everywhere. They're more in a tighter spot unless the food is pushing them along and there's not much there and they clean it up and move on or whatever. But most of the time when you find good sign like that early, Mm -hmm. you can get in there and get close and figure out what's going on, hang a trail camera, maybe even make a mock scrape. And uh, even use sand in it. I've done that. Yeah. And see how, see if you get a deer on it. And if you do, see how he reacts to it. See if he's daylighting. And then kind of go from there just with your process of, you know, where you're actually going to hang and hunt. But it's hard to find that sign early. Yeah. You got to cover a lot of ground. Because like I said, they're not, they're not expanding much. And some of them are still in even small groups. A lot of times these bigger bucks, even the smaller ones, they'll be like, they'll have a little one with them. The big bucks will have a smaller buck with them or one the same age, you know, all the way up until now. The ones I had on camera that I was hunting the other day, they stayed together. Okay, yeah. And some of the other ones I've killed in the past have had like a 18-month to two-and-a-half-year-old buck with them, and it'll be a five-and-a-half-year-old buck that I've hunted for years, <laughs> and they'll be carrying a little buck with him. Wow, that's great. They'll be hanging together. Yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, that's kind of on the food that's what you need to look for early okay to get it started what about after early season what how does the food kind of change and transition what should you be looking for you a lot of times you get more on the ground then and some of the other producing species trees will start dropping like your beech sometimes they're a little bit later and uh, post oak is something i really love to if i can find them i usually am in deer pretty consistently because they they seem to prefer those even over white oak Really? Even though they're smaller, it's, I mean, it's in the white oak family, but I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's less bitter, less acidic or what, but I have a lot of luck. When those things drop, I'm, I'm looking and I'm usually finding deer in them. How are you, how are you, and I'm not a tree expert, so how do you identify a post oak versus a, a white oak? Post oaks, they're usually on lower side index areas. They look kind of like a white oak. They got a little bit more platier bark on them. And, uh, they're uh, usually not quite as big as a white oak. Okay. And they still have the low leaves and stuff like a white oak. Sure. But there's a lot of similarities to the, it and a white oak, but the acorns are really small. You know, they usually have little streaks on them, little small streaks, kind of like a southern red oak. Okay. <clears throat> but they drop later. They usually don't drop really early unless you get like an extreme weather event that comes in and knocks them off or you got a, you know, heavy squirrel population that's up there cutting the caps off and knocking them down. Right. So that kind of extends your food source. Your white oaks drop early, it but does. now your post oaks are kind of dropping a little bit later, same yep. time frame as the beach. Yep. And the beach, they're the same way. A lot of those are down low and kind of in the drainages and then the, on the lower parts of the slopes, and they don't get to catch as much wind in those areas, but they just kind of open up, and that little nut comes out and hits the ground, and there'll be places where deer feed there won't even be any leaves a lot of times where you got beets dropping. They'll clean the leaves out where they can come back and find them. 
mm. and turkeys will be in there scratching. It's bare ground. Wow. Around beech trees a lot of times. Unless it's <clears> – <throat> usually that's on a hillside is where it's bare ground because there's just so much traffic on it. And then when it rains on it, it washes it down. Mm-hmm. But they keep coming back to these trees because they're continuously dropping. But uh, I've heard a lot of people say they've never seen a deer eat a beech nut, and I don't know. I've, I've seen a lot of deer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've killed deer. <laughs> I've seen them well, bedding but, right under beech trees. I mean, eating. just to think about, it sounds like be, uh, being out here and spending as much time as you hunt, I mean, you sound like a mountain man who's always <laughs> out there in the woods. You know, you can obviously you know your trees and – but you're just noticing, you're observing all these things as you're out there and have put this in your mental playbook of like, this is what I see, this is what I'm kind of keying off of and why I make decisions um, based off the time of year, what I'm noticing, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it all plays in. It's a big dynamic. And uh, like I said, on the preferred food, as far as beach goes, I've had a lot of luck actually killing deer in those areas where it's thick and but there's been acorns in there too, usually. There's been a couple of years I've killed deer in there where there's not been anything else, but you kind of just got to look when you go and see where most of the feed sign is and see what they're actually wanting. But I do know the post oaks. I'll go back to those. Sometimes it's like mid-November before they really drop hard. And there's a transition there. You'll have deer that aren't in that area. and So there's not that many on the ground in late October. But then you get up in November or have a weather event come through, knocks a bunch of them off, whatever causes them to fall, and they're down on the ground. And like second week of November, maybe sometime in gun season, the deer will move to those things. Really? Yes. So you got to be keyed in on where those are at. <laughs> big one I killed last year, that's what that's what those deer were on. There was a, a few black oak in there too, but the post oak, I saw the post oak in there early. I went there scouting and I actually saw them on the trees. But it took forever for them to fall. I wasn't high on the mountain. I was on the lower third. I wasn't down the creek. I was on the lower third. And uh, I told Lane, I said, there's a big buck in here. I didn't hear one getting killed last year in here. And I mean, horning some giant trees. Didn't, no trail camera pictures. And I didn't even hang any cameras in there. I already knew what I was going to do. Yeah. And uh, I went in there and found that those post oaks were dropping. And... That's what I told Lane. I said, as soon as they start dropping, I'm going in there. And it was gun season before they really started. So I went in there and I killed that big one the first morning. That first morning? First morning I went in there. Wow. So you... I've been in there scouting, but that's the first morning I actually went in there. I went in there with my traditional bow and hunted a couple times. Okay. We had some people come in on us <laughs> when we were in there. Oh, man, that's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. But uh, other than that, that was the first time I'd been in there. You know, with a gun. So you knew, you're kind of coming into it. You you found the post oaks. You had done the scouting. You know there's a buck in there. You've been seeing the sign. Mm-hmm. So going in there, you knew, like, when those start dropping, it's time to be there. And sure enough, it was exactly the right move. That's exactly the way it happened. And That's awesome. There was snow on the ground that morning. You could see, I've got it on a video on YouTube. You can go in there and watch it. You could see where they'd been feeding under those post oaks when that snow had come in that night. They'd been in there after that snow, you know, all under those post oaks feeding leading in there to where I was hunting. I actually killed a bear that morning, too. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, no on top way. of the ridge, I killed him going in, yeah. This is a true mountain man over here. <laughs> I had a I had a load in the truck. I bet you did. There. Sounds like it. It took me half the morning to get everything drug out of there. A bear and a huge buck. That's a great that was day. awesome. <laughs> I would have quartered the buck up, but I thought, man, I, not many times you kill both in the same day. I want them both in the back of the truck. <laughs> so I went the extra mile and went ahead and drug him out. That's awesome. So post oaks dropping in November. Um, what about after that? After that, are I mean at this point you <clears> might be tagged out. Or mo- <laughs> well, sometimes bugs. it depends on how high you got your standards. Yeah, and you know what's if you're actually after a really big deer. Yeah, a lot of times that's when I win or tag when I've got one that I'm really trying to kill, and then try to my best you know to kill him late. But most of the time I'm tagged out by then. Yeah, because I can't stand it, but. Uh, <laughs> But what what some, would be the food sources after that? So you got the post oak are still on the ground usually then, so it kind of goes into December. Uh, I've seen southern red oak drop really late too, like really late. I've went in before places where there's snows on the ground in late season, and those southern red oak be on the ground on top of the snow. Wow! And deer sign everywhere in there. Mm. Just I mean, all kinds of sign on top of the snow. And you've got uh, locust. You've got honey locusts that produces those bean pods. That's kind of more of a thing 
I've heard people talking about them hunting them down south Arkansas, but I have seen deer up here feed on them. Mm -hmm. But it's usually when you have no mass crop, and it'll be late season, and you can go in there and find them in those late season. Black gum berries, they'll feed hard on black gum berries if they've hit nothing else. If it it's more kind of a soft mass, it's a you know what they look like little berry. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I've even seen them. Of course, this is more of a fall thing, but I've seen them eat sugar maple leaves. Just go through mm, the woods, pick really? them up. Oh yeah, eating them. They say that it releases the starch turns to sugar after they're on the ground so long after they fall off. And uh, I've seen them eat them on the ground. They'll be, you know, just color for leaves, and they'll be going through there picking them up, eating them. Wow. Matter of fact, I've got one. It may have been the first one I ever posted on YouTube. It was late October, and that buck was eating leaves. I don't know if I got it all on film, but I kept watching him come in. I was like, he's he's eating the leaves. <laughs> he's going, he's, I knew there were some acorns in there, but I had a bunch of them right there around my stand. He fed around me for a long time on those, but. As he was coming in, I watched him eat. Don't tell him how many leaves. He probably filled half his stomach up with leaves. He had a sugar maple salad that day. He did. Yeah, he was. But there's a, and of course you got grass too. Yeah. In the late season. When everything turns brown, and when you get later on in November, it seems like the winter's kind of later up here on the mountain now. It used to, it get colder in October. Now it seems like it's warmer in November, and it's like almost the end of November before we really get cold. Mm -hmm. When things start turning brown, it seems like deer, they want some kind of green in their diet. So they will transition sometimes to grass. Mm, okay. Whenever you hit that time period or whenever that stuff starts to change and turn, you know, more brown, and it's not as palatable. The leaves are more crunchy and they're more dead, and they like something that's palatable, that's green. Like I said, I think it's just got to be in their diet. Yeah. You'll see a lot of deer at night out on the roadside. That time of year, they'll be out there, right, up to, right there on the side of the road eating grass. Yeah, just waiting for you to come by and almost hit them. <laughs> yep, that's right. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of different food sources. Yeah. Late, it just depends on what's actually you know, there. And sometimes, like I said, if, that locust, if those locust beans are the only thing that's there and you can find a patch of them, and a lot of times you're in the deer. And a lot of times you're in a good buck, too, because it's thick in a lot of places where they are. Sometimes yeah. they're up on the hillsides a little ways and then the bottoms. Sometimes they're in little swags on ridges. But I know lots of places where there's little patches of them. I don't like to walk in them too much. You get them stuck through your shoe. Those are those <laughs> super spiky, like, yep. devil thorn trees, yep. right? I got, my, got one of my foot a few years ago. And it through took, your boot? Yeah, it went right through my boot. No way. I had a hiking boot on. It went right through there, and I think it took me, like, almost two months to get over it. It was, oh, it was bad. Yeah, those are scary looking uh i was my my father-in-law he hunts down in texas and he was just talking the other day he saw a couple of deer come in they were eating on those pods yep. those big bean pods i was uh, like no way and he took a video sent it to me i was like sure enough yeah i've seen i've seen them come through and eat bark off a tree yeah i've seen them eat you know even like kind of like a goat that lichen or whatever it is that kind of grayish looking stuff on trees Some of that moss. Uh, the moss yeah it's moss it's yeah. got like a little it kind of shines when the sun hits it i've watched deer come through and eat that right off a tree man before so food <laughs> source for you is like that's top of the list like i i'm depending on the time of year i'm noticing what's on the ground the mass crop you know where it's at if it's still up in the tree if it's on the ground like that's kind of where you start yeah okay yeah that's a good starting place and like i said i've got a buck that I've been trying to get on camera this year that I had on camera last year. And I want him to be on camera there, but he's just not going to be because I have not found the first acorn on the ground in there. Mm. And I don't have – there's one tiny scrape. That's all there is. That's all you got. And it's positive terrain. I mean, it's some of the best, but he, he's just not there. It just won't be there. It makes sense that food is the uh, number one. Yeah, I mean – like the, Once you hone in on that, you're going to find your deer. Yeah. There's some beach in there, but it hasn't dropped yet. Okay. But there's no acorns on the ground whatsoever. Yeah. And there's one tiny scrape, and that's it. It's, Man, yeah. That's I had tough. a few does on camera coming through there. Yeah. And a bear, too, just passing through, but nothing else. Man. I mean, I could probably find that buck, but I'm I'm going to look elsewhere. I know there's there's too much food in other places that I mm -hmm. found this year, and he may need another year anyway. Yeah. He'll be ancient, though, if he gets by this year. So food's commandment number one. You talked a little bit about scrapes. I don't know if there's any perfect order. But would you put scrapes at number two for just 
maybe if we're just doing a list? Yeah, for early season. All right. Because it's, it's very significant, like I said, to find that sign. Okay. So talk to us about some scrapes. Yeah, it's, oh, it can get complicated when you talk about it. Not necessarily complicated. I know you just did like a whole episode <laughs> on this with the Southern yeah. Outdoorsman guys. Think, uh, think scrapes for the guy who's going, man, I'm a uh, been hunting for three years. I've got a nice buck, but it's kind of by accident. Man, I'm trying to figure it out. It's an experimental thing with scrapes. You got to experiment with them and see what's going to work for you and where the right area is. Because, like I said, this year I found those two that were hot, you know, on the edge of that pine stand up high. And I got excited when I saw them, but I thought, man, I, there's no way I'm hanging out. I'm not hunting out here. I'm going I'm going down there to the other spot because I just don't have confidence in them daylighting on those scrapes. So that's the first thing is find a place where you got to get pretty close to them. And they may range out a little bit. And when they're busting out of those bachelor groups, you may find those kind of isolated satellite scrapes, but they'll go cold quick. You won't see anything rework them. And... You talk about community scrapes. People talk about them. I don't know if that's an early thing. It's it's definitely a pre rut thing, and even in the rut. But early season, it's almost like a signpost. A big buck is making a signpost. Okay, seems to me like, or where I've had luck on them because where I went in there and I've cleaned the scrape out and I put bucks in in there, and I've even used doe estrus before too back in the day and. I don't. I can't remember when the last time I actually put some out and killed a deer on it, but the buck scent worked pretty good for me. I get a pretty positive reaction, and some deer even I would have them close to daylight hours, but not, you know, actually daylight hours within thirty minutes to an hour. Right. And I would go in there and I'd uh, really juice that scrape up and uh, monitor it, and uh, I'll be dang if I didn't start getting daylights, a few daylights. So basically, you're saying. You're at these scrapes. You've got cameras out. You know there's bucks coming in and using them, but they're all at night. So you're starting to put in some bucks in, trying to get them to kind of flip to the daytime so you can have a chance at them. Yeah, if you're close enough. Like if you're on one of those scrapes where you're getting them in the middle of the night and you have no idea, you know, it's like, well, I mean, there's no confidence there for me. But if it's close, you know, if it's close to that time, to the daylight hours, then I'll, I'll either move a little bit or I'll try that scent and just see what kind of reaction I get. And sometimes if it's multiple bucks, I mean, you'll still, like this one this year, I had multiple bucks hit that one. I didn't put any sand out in it, though. You didn't? Didn't put a lick of sand out in it. I just went in there and broke some limbs down and really stirred the dirt up good where they could smell it. I knew right where these deer were coming up, though. I mean, there was a bunch of trees that were on this hillside that were down, and you could see where those deer were coming out of that rough and going around those trees. I mean, it wasn't like a trail, but you could see the yeah. indentions in the ground where they were coming up. And okay. That's exactly the way the buck come from that I killed. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't put any scent out in it at all, but I think within three days after I hung the camera, I don't remember, I'd have to go back and look, but uh, I had two bucks come up there and work that scrape. And then ever since, I, once they came up there and hit it, it just, I mean, it all happened. Yeah. I started having... Multiple bucks come in there. But like I said, I didn't know it until I went and checked that camera. I pulled that card when I went there and killed that deer and switched it and got back and had four bucks on it from the time me and Lane went there and hung the stand Jeez. to when I killed it. <clears throat> and one one other pretty good one, and it was a totally different deer. The, one of them was. It was one I didn't even, I mean, it wasn't one I had on camera. Yeah, so you're, I mean, you're excited. You're <laughs> in there pulling the card, and you're like, oh, yeah. man, we're in the money. And I checked it again. After that, and I had that same buck in there two or three more times in this cold front uh, in the morning, pretty close to the moon time, uh, coming through there in daylight, hitting that scrape again. Man. But I didn't go back in there and hunt it. Yeah. I thought, well, I need to I need to start looking again. There was quite a bit of hunting pressure in there, too. And that was one of the reasons why I was kind of leery about going in there hunting. I was like, well... Where I'm at, though, I don't think anybody's going up in there. And I don't think they had them pressured up in there or anything. I just think that's where they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't think the pressure pushed them in there. I think that's just where they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I saw some deer going in there to check that camera one morning. I saw a pretty nice buck. And then when me and Lane went in there to get that deer, we saw three bucks on the road going in there to get that deer. They were all small, just yeah. six points. But but the acorns, they were, they were dropping a little bit later in there. I didn't really notice a good 
I didn't notice many even right in there where I was hunting until I went in there and hunted. But they really started dropping, like right in there when I was going in there to hunt. They started to hit the ground. And is your scrape strategy mostly mostly early season or, or kind of into when the rut is really ramping up with the thought that I know they may be checking them on the run to go find does, but once they're just chasing like crazy, they could be anywhere and everywhere and they're being they're being weird. Or talk me through that because I've I've hunted them different ways and I mean I yeah. feel like I just can't figure out the scrape. Sometimes it's like, man, it looks hot. I'll sit there for a couple days, nothing. Yeah, a lot of the what you'll see on that is if you're in that negative terrain, it'll be a good sign, fresh, smoking. And you'll see it, and man, I got to get on this. But yeah. it's stuff they're using after dark. Negative train meaning it's. I got that phrase off of the other, some guy that was on that other podcast, but it was so good I can't not use it. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. It's There's negative and positive train. Yeah. Okay. It's it's not conducive for hunting or you're not going to be able to get in there at the right time. <laughs> yeah, it's, not, deal. it's just not good for daylight. Got you it. You know, on mature deer. You might see, and not to say they won't come across it, especially when does are coming in heat. If they're on a doe or if they know a doe is close to coming in and they're hanging right with them, they can pull them across stuff like that. But usually if they're just traveling on their own, they're going to be in that more positive terrain. I've seen too many of them do it. I said it before, they'll – some of these real mature deer walk in places you never thought they would walk. That's how I found a lot of my good spots. They're adjusted. I've found something on a map that I went in there and and hunted, but then I've almost been in an observation tree because I end up moving two or three times. I watch how those deer are using the terrain. I'm like, yep, I'm off the mark. I'm wrong, yeah. I need to get a little bit more that way or, or down the hill a little yep. bit or up you the hill. You still got to be close enough where you can see them. But yeah. There's still, you know, more adjustments to be made. That's how I've kind of figured a lot of that out. So when you're talking about experimentation with scrapes and, and Kyle's talking about how do you kind of, as the season transitions, what does your strategy do on, on scrapes and how do you kind of approach that differently? So if it's, you get closer to the, you get in that pre-rut time, let's say late October, that's something else i got to mention too. It, I don't know if it's it's dependent on the moon or what it is, but sometimes early November when you think the rut should be started, it can be like early season. There's nothing going on. I mean, there's no bucks chasing does. You're not even seeing a whole lot of scrapes, and uh, sometimes you do. But I've even had it to where it's been like November the 25th before I've even seen a buck chasing a doe and that late. Wow. And it was uh, almost like a trickle rut thing. But usually that pre-rut, late October, early November, those community scrapes, come into play pretty good then and you get into that those another phrase that was coined the compounding features where you got a lot of things coming together and you got multiple deer from different deer networks that are coming to an area traveling it's a place where they can travel and feel comfortable and it's just multiple deer coming through that one area you've got a scrape there that multiple deer are hitting when that's the best here in the mountains is when you've got that widespread mass crop because they just get up and they, you know, they they get in transit a little bit more. They start expanding. They go a lot further, it seems to me like. And okay. I get more pictures of different bucks. Whereas if it's not a widespread and it's real spotty, then they're going to confine in one area. And especially if it's like really spotty, you go, you know, eight, ten miles between places where you got acorns then it's like you got to be there where the food is to be on the deer. Gotcha. They don't get up and – I mean, they'll eat leaves <clears throat> off the trees if they have to. They'll uh, they'll be some, you know, rogue deer here and there throughout the landscape, but they will gravitate – the majority of them will gravitate towards those food sources. But when it's widespread, that sign that uh, those community scrapes and transitions, funnels, contour breaks, anything that – a buck will travel that uh, you can find sign on it when that sign is like that when you when that sign they're making that sign and you find those community scrapes and you get pictures of multiple bucks i'll drill down on those places and hunt them day after day after day i won't i won't in late move. october yes i don't move yeah if, unless i've got a big buck that i'm trying to target and hunt that i know he's not moving he's got his own area and he's staying in there and he's kind of boss of that place but those deer will get up and move and hit those areas like that. They'll come through those transition funnels, and 
they'll work them a lot more. And you don't have to worry as much about spooking deer either because you're not hunting a particular deer. And you may even be getting different does coming through that area. You just need to get in there and just, you hear a lot of people say, oh, the first two times is the best. The first three times, you know, after that, your odds go down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not then, they don't. Then is when you want to hunt. If you got seven days straight to hunt it, hunt it seven days straight. Same, you'll like set up old, in the same spot. Like the old timers used to say, find a good stand and get on it and sit there. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. The compounding features, say you have a, say you have a ridge line and it's filled with oaks and they're dropping and there's positive terrain. You know, there's a good funnel. There's a bunch of deer sign. And then, I mean, I'm given an ideal scenario. Then there's a big community scrape. It makes sense. You're going to see that and go, I'm not moving. <laughs> like this is, this is where I'm going to be. You've put in the work to find it. You're going to be there. Like deer are going to come through. They're going to check it out. They're, you're going to want to hunt it. That Absolutely. makes sense to me. Yes. yes. And I've found some places like that too, that I've heard some other guys, like I said, there's all kinds of good hunters that you listen to some of these different podcasts. Some of these guys, they, uh, there's not one individual that knows everything about yeah. everything. There's so much to learn about these creatures that it's unreal. And I've learned a lot listening to some of these guys. It's made me think about a lot of things. But uh, one thing I heard was like in the and I, I I tried to stay away from them, and I found really good sign in them is in the like in the bottoms of the drainages where you've got several features coming together. Mm-hmm. Little creeks coming together. You got points coming off. You got and there's sign everywhere in there. Yeah. Good sign. But, man, have I ever had trouble hunting that stuff. It's tough to get in there, man. You can't. Well, they smell you. And uh, it's kind of like a social deal, like this one guy said. It's like a social hub, he called it. And that's, that's kind of what it is. It's all these deer, you know, living on this mountain, this mountain, this mountain. They're all coming off into this one area, and they're making sign. Yeah. Most of it's at night. And a hot doe could drag one through there, but you still got the the thermals that are swirling down there to deal with. That yeah, they're gonna smell you. I've had them smell me so much places like that. I've got one spot that I can hunt there. I found one that I think I can get by with it with a bow, and I'm up on a bank, almost up, kind of on the side of a beech tree. I set a chair on it. You're almost in a tree stand. You're so high above it. Oh yeah. But if the wind funnels down that creek parallel with it. So if you can get a shot at them before they cross or if they just come parallel, you might have a chance. But I've seen bucks come right off that hillside behind me. Never thought one would ever come off of that. You can barely stand up on it. Wow. I was hunting it one day with a muzzleloader, and a buck came off behind me and come 10 steps by me, and he was sliding down the hill the whole way no like way. a horse coming down it. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Went down there and smelled the scrape and went right down the creek. <laughs> That's wild. Like, Man. But I, I had to check that spot. I, I just couldn't stay out of it. And I hunted it a little bit and hung camera in there and had lots of good deer on camera. But it's just hard to – I don't have – I would stay out of places like that unless you got a rifle. Mm. And you can sit way up on the hill yeah. and watch it. But still, even at that, your scent's liable to go down in there and swirl around. Mm. Problem is, when you don't get wind in those bottoms, your scent will just pull up around your tree. And just keep going down, you're breathing or whatever, you know. You can't get completely scent free. I mean, you can try. You can fool him. You're not going to completely and totally eliminate his nose. But And then when the wind does pick up or the thermals start moving, it just moves all your scent just all around it. Yeah, it does. All different directions. And they just swirl. There's a guy I used to work with. He had a scent company, and he had uh, it was dough bowls. And uh, I used to blow those in a tree yeah. and watch them. That's how I learned what these thermals really do called dough bowls dough bubbles or bubbles? uh dough blows what it's called oh dough blows but i don't think they i don't think they're in business anymore they make make some for their sales and stuff but okay i used it for years but uh i'd use those if it was like a high pressure day and uh, there wasn't much moisture in there the bubbles would pop mm-hmm. you know after they went so far but if it was kind of humid they'd stay together you know it wouldn't pop for a long time those things would take off, and it may be a minute and a half later, all of a sudden they're coming back through. No but, way. Yeah. You, you hadn't blown any bubbles in a long time, and all of a sudden, shoo, a bubble comes back through. They'd be coming back through. So that just shows the swirl that yeah. the scent is just carrying around, yep. coming that's back. That's why it's so tough. <laughs> oh, man. And that's why these big bucks, I think, walk so slowly and stand and look, like I was telling you before we started this. Yeah. They will stand there and wait on that. They'll wait on that thermal change. They'll wait on that wind shift. And they can check several different angles and several different places before they move again. Wow. Just by standing there. Just That's by crazy. standing there. 
and they'll pull up, like if you're hunting on a big flat or something, that's like a field almost. That's that negative terrain. If you got positive terrain next to that negative terrain, he will pull up there and stand there and scan that like it's a field. Mm -hmm. And he'll check that, he'll let that, he'll let the thermals play into his favor and then he'll let the wind before he moves. But I've seen so many of them. I mean, they move, you'll think it's a squirrel. And just feeding around, then all of a sudden you look, and it's been a buck there the whole time. Wow, because he's moving that slow. Yeah, man, that's, that's how they get big, is. though. Yeah, it oh, is. Yeah. So, so is that kind of where you would go next? Like, if you're talking about, we covered. I know we. If you want to hear more about scrapes, there's so much more to talk about. Go listen to the Southern Outdoorsman. They just, like I said, did a whole episode with you on that. From there, if we kind of skip past scrapes, where would you go next? Would you say scent or terrain? Yeah, terrain plays in pretty big. Okay. Like if you get into the rut, yeah, the funnels, you know, they play in pretty hard. Let's go there then, terrain. Yeah, it's anything. Of course, up here you got bluffs. It's just you got bluff ends, gaps in bluffs. You got places where they come up and down. You got like rocky spots that are not as rocky on the side of a ridge where they kind of can come down. You just got drains that come up that are really steep. And they got a little place where they can kind of cross out the head of them, or there's a bowl where you got thermals pulling. They call them thermal hubs, kind of up in those areas. They'll travel those. They'll travel with their nose, and they'll travel with that positive terrain. And around here, it's a lot of it's beach because they like to have that cover that equals to positive terrain because they feel comfortable where they're walking. They can't, you know, be seen. And, uh, as far as bedding, too, I'm kind of getting off subject there. Well, g maybe give me a little more detail. And you've said it a couple of times, but just so make sure I understand, when you say positive terrain, negative terrain, what exactly are you talking about? So just what I said a minute ago, in the on the positive, it's going to be positive for the deer, for the mature deer. Okay. For where he can move and he feels comfortable. Okay. Where he's not out in the wide open where somebody's going to bust him with a 30 out 6 from 150 yards. Gotcha. <clears throat> and that that can be a lot of different. That can be a rough, rocky hillside. That can be, you know, a lot of thick cover. Like, see, the beach, they keep their leaves on all the way until spring, until the new growth comes in and pushes them off. So that's almost like you're in an early season spot. Gotcha. If you've got a big place where there's a mountainside that's got beach all over it. And not the bigger trees, but it's the saplings and the mid-story and the understory that's got the low-hanging limbs. You'll find a lot of scrapes, too, under those where they're traveling in these areas where they've got more cover in that positive terrain. It's positive terrain with like a narrow bench above or below bluff, like where I killed that last deer, a little couple narrow benches with a little ridge intersecting them. That's positive terrain because people just don't walk in those places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you're going to find sheds in those places too if you get out. I found a bunch of them in turkey seasons when I find them. Yeah. I used to find a lot of them in turkey season. I'd be out after a turkey because when else are you going to be walking in a place like that? Right. You're cruising through looking for turkeys. Yep. <clears throat> and you can see where a lot of these deer, you know, are actually bedding and staying in the late season. And sometimes it's the same place they were staying in the early season if the food hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. But you'll find them in some snarf holes. I mean, it's, like I said, there's so many of those out here and they're so protected in them. You can't really get in there. And with a rifle, you can't go in there. A lot of people like to slip hunt. You can't get a shot at those deer. I mean, you can you can shoot for hair when you get in your scope and hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you, once you jump them in that stuff, they're, they're gone. They're gone, yeah. And they can, they're going to bed where they can, you know, see what they can't smell and smell what they can't see. So that's why they're so elusive. This terrain allows them to be that way, and they're just, these mountain deer are tough. They're smart. If you could pick like an ideal terrain, if you were going to have one spot and you're like, man, when I'm, if I'm walking through or maybe I'm, I'm kind of topo scouting, I'm looking at Onyx and trying to get an idea, I'm looking for this, what would be kind of the one feature or thing that you would key in on? If I'm just looking at a topo map, I like to find two or three big drainages that are rough that lead up to the saddle or some kind of place where does are going to be crossing out a good, a good place where the, there's a path of least resistance for the rest of the deer herd. Okay. And then it's just gnarly and nasty on both sides of it, or maybe on four sides of it. Yeah. You know, it could be rough, steep up above it and steep below it, and then two big drainages coming in from both sides. 
stuff like that's kind of what I look for if I'm just looking just strictly at terrain. And then uh, I talked about the contour breaks just on the sides of the mountains too where it's real steep. You got a little narrow bench or you got a flat comes out and then it gets real steep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll get on that break of those. A lot of times they get down on them though. These big bucks, I'm telling you, they'll walk in places it's, they know where to, they know where to avoid people. Yeah. They know where to avoid the, <laughs> it's not like they, you know, know right where the humans are. It's just, it's mother nature. It's just built it into them. That's just how they survive. They yeah. use that nose and they use that cover and they use the places that are where they're going to have the least disturbance. And that's the positive terrain. Gotcha. And they can use the wind too, like I said, where they'll pull up in those little hubs and they can sit there and wind and smell or the places where the bubble will come back through in a minute and a half after you've I might have to see if I can find some of those again. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. You've got me wanting to sit in the stand with my two year old <laughs> bubble yeah. machine. <laughs> I, pass, <laughs> uh, I used to pass a lot of time doing that too in the stand. I'd sit there and man, I'd blow those bubbles and watch them. <laughs> it's like a game. I actually killed deer too, coming right to them, smelling them. The bubbles? Yep. No way. Killed a huge eight point one time. I was in the spot to kill a buck. Yeah. But he came in right behind me and those bubbles had been going pretty consistently behind me and then up through that little bowl. But there was a cedar tree there. When the thermal would pull it, it would pull it up that cedar tree, and they'd all pop on that cedar tree. That big dude come in there. I could see his legs come in. Then I saw his horns like on both sides of a tree sticking out, and I was like, he's a monster. <laughs> and he came up and sniffed those bubbles on that tree. And then I shot him at like 20-something yards just right there. Wow. He bailed off the hill and went over a big gap in the bluff, and I had to have my dad go in there and help me drag it out. But, yeah, he was a big one. Did anyone ever coin you as the bubble blowing deer slayer? <laughs> no, because I didn't come up with him. It was another guy, him and his buddy. Like I said, I need to talk to him and see if he still got any. I, I bet he still uses them. Yeah, because he was like, yeah, he consistently uses used them. Oh, that's pretty cool. I never heard lots of stories. Using that. No, it never got big. It never really hit the main market. It was just around here, and then people at work would buy them. Yeah, stuff sure. off of him. He'd make some kind of soap in there and he had he had synthetic one year and it actually smelled pretty good it was like dough esters but i don't even know what kind of soap he was using yeah sometimes the soap would get too thin you couldn't blow the bubbles and you'd have to get something put in there to make it a little thicker <laughs> so we've covered food then we hit scrapes then we hit terrain sounds we, like we've covered seasons too and we're not going to, we don't really need to make it its own <laughs> of the Ten Commandments. I think seasons, understanding in all of it are really important. It's like a big part of the, the season whole for the food and yeah. where the train and how you're going to breed the scrapes and all of that. So I okay. just wanted to put that in there. So, so technically, we're, we're at, say that's four. <laughs> we're at five. So now the next one would be five. Yes. If we talk, so let's, let's, you're kind of keying in on it there, but you were talking about scent, wind, thermals, stuff like that general principles and philosophies when you're talking about hunting the hills hunting these hollers chasing after these bucks in in the in the ozarks where how would you cover that first if you're talking just scent you got to look at your own be real be stealthy when as far as scent control a lot of people don't believe in it but i do i said there's a bunch of people that swing very far on either pendulum here it's oh, crazy yeah. that that's so do. it don't matter and it matters everything yeah, yeah. i mean so where do you fall? In the way the I look at it, that's like that the ten thing. It's like I'm gonna put every odd in my favor I can. Sure. I'm not gonna go out there after you know working all day. I'm gonna I, I bag my clothes a lot, you know, before I go in. And early season, a lot of times I'll just go in and pair of shorts, pair of rubber boots, and I'll have everything separate. And I won't even put it on until I get in the stand, just because of the sweat. But uh, I don't know. I've tried tried about everything. And I don't see that one thing really works better than the other. It's just, you know, practicing it. Basically, best do, you can. do what you can. Do what you can. And if I got a buck that I know he's coming in on me, I will not breathe through my mouth. I will shallow breathe through my nose. And a lot of times I'll put a mask over my face if it's November and it's cold. Mm. I don't want, yeah, it's like I just try to just breathe as shallow as I can. I try to do it through my nose. Yeah. I don't. I don't breathe through my mouth when I got when I know one's coming in on me. Even that the fog of your breath, you just worried about. I think that's what they smell a lot. Yeah, and you know, I don't know. 
some people believe in scent blocker. I've heard it really works, but they got those things you can cover your face with. I haven't ever tried them. I'm thinking about it. Just something to breathe into just to knock that down a little bit. Hmm. Because, I mean, I went in before. I know I'm pretty well good on my clothes. And the other thing is, is your approach on that. When you're coming in, and it ain't just the buck smelling you. I don't like to come in where I know he's going to be walking through. I'll, I'll circle around. I'll come in. However I think he's not going to be traveling, coming mm-hmm. to me, is where I'm going to walk in. I'm going to circle. And and when I do that, I'm going to make sure not touch bushes. I'm going to – it's like I'm going to go through there like I'm in the Matrix. I mean, I'm going to be moving. <laughs> yeah. I go slow. Yeah. Because I've had them so many times where I've touched a bush, you know, and – with my hand, and I've seen the, a doe come in there and smell it where I touched it. Right bush. where you touched it. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. And so I'm real careful about that. Is there anything special you do with your, you, you mentioned, you know you're good with your clothes. You've got your scent kind of in, in control. Is there anything special you do just to make sure that you feel confident about that, like not having a whole lot of scent? I, be, I mainly bag them. Like I said, I put them in that bag, and then there's all different kinds of things out there on the market that, May or may not work. You can try them. Just have them clean is the main thing. Yeah. Just clean. I've got a thing I tried this year. I'm still on the fence about it. It's a walnut rue that I put together. And those are kind of acidic, so I can see how that might, you know, break some of that down. So, Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of a little bit iffy on the smell. It kind of smells a little bit soured when you spray it on your clothes. Mm. But then after it sets on it for a little bit, you can't smell a thing. Really? And that's kind of what the guy said that, you know, I found this out from that I watched. And I was like, hmm, that may be the deal. I kind of like to know what, you know, his smelled like when he put his together. But <laughs> <clears throat> I'll let Lane try that. I'll let him be the guinea pig. Yeah, somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him go out there and test it. <laughs> that's the first thing with, with scent is your own. Be stealthy with that and then getting in and out. And that's... Like I said, it's not as big a deal if you're hunting those funnels in that closer to rut time. It can be because mm-hmm. I've had, you know, does. Usually they're getting pushed so hard by the bucks they're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. But if they're just easing through and the buck's a long ways behind her, if she picks up on you, I mean, she's going to take him the other way. She'll take him right away from you. Yeah. And it's not just the buck you're trying to fool. And those old does, they're just as smart as the big bucks. Mm-hmm. They've been around the scene a lot more. <clears throat> I mean, they've had lots of encounters with people and smelled lots of people. Yeah. So you got to be careful with them. I've been out trying to kill them with a traditional bow in late season, and it is, I mean, it's just like trying to kill them with your deer. You cannot hardly, you can't draw back on them. If you do get them in there, they're so jumpy. It's just the does are, they're smart. Yeah. So you got to fool all of them's nose, not just the, <clears throat> not just the bucks. But uh, as far as the scent goes, Deer scent, that time of year, I like it, I like it in the pre-rut. I'll use it all the way up to there, but then when the actual rut kicks off, I kind of go away from it. Okay. I don't mess with it as much. I'm not saying I don't. If it gets, if that period hits where the scrapes went cold for a quite some time and then all of a sudden you start seeing a little bit more and it may be, you know, they may kind of be in that in-between spot in the rut, I'll go out there and I'll kind of try to recheck them then and use some scent and see what I can get. But I still have the better luck earlier and late with it. Gotcha. Early up to pre-rut and then late season with the scent is like the most consistent. Okay. For actually getting one in a scrape in front of you where you can shoot it. Something else I'll I'll say about the scrapes, and I said it before on that last podcast, but you don't know how many bucks will come up to those things and not hit them. They will go around them. Mm. I've got one. I killed that big buck a couple of years ago. I passed up a really good deer with a bow. He walks right up there, and you can see him on video, wins the scrape, circles around it. I never got him on camera, but I videoed him at 23 yards mm. going around it. Yeah. They go long time, eight point. Wow. But, uh, yeah, more than that deer did that. I've seen in, in there and other places. Absolutely. They'll come in, they'll check it, but they won't go all the way to it. They won't go they'll all the way to check it. it. Yep. And I've had picture after picture at night where they do the same thing. They'll circle around. They'll go around it, and that's, I'll set my camera up where I can see quite a ways behind them, usually. I'll set them off the scrape a pretty good ways, and then I can see quite a bit of ground behind them because you'll have them, you know, a lot of them in the middle of the night, a buck you've never seen before. He'll be way back there coming around it. And they do the same thing in the daylight. <clears throat> 
It's amazing how many of them do it, though. Mm-hmm. It's There's so many of them that do it. Yeah. And then the scrape lines, I talked about this, too. You, you'll have different bucks on different levels of the mountain. I've had cameras, like, just two benches off, and you'll have a different buck or a different set of bucks using that scrape line. And then you'll drop off on another level, and you'll have a different buck using that one or a different set of bucks. I've noticed that. <clears throat> but, like I said, a lot of that's at night unless it's in that really good terrain where you can go in there and think you can kill them in the daylight. But I've hung cameras on ones like that just to kind of see and observe and experiment and see what bucks are actually coming through throughout a year's time, you know, and see what's actually traveling those scrape lines and maybe try to figure something out. A lot of people don't like to let cameras soak. I like to let them soak. I'll move them too, especially if I'm hunting a big deer. And I'm really trying to figure him out. Yeah. I'll really move cameras around. I had a place last year. I moved like four cameras, three or four cameras in there a lot. I moved them probably two times a piece. But I'll have cameras that I'll leave out almost the whole season. And sometimes even after because I learn a lot about what goes on throughout the year. Yeah, just watching them throughout the season. Seeing what happens, yep. Interesting. And watching the food, see if the food source is still in there and kind of see. And then I shot one one year. I had a video on it. I was on the management area, and I shot three giant bucks in one day. And I only connected with one. Two of them were like upper 140-class deer. What? Yeah, one was a 14, one was a 12, and then the one I shot at 2 o'clock in the day was a probably a 125, 130-inch eight-point. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, yeah, that was crazy. I got him on camera like in December. He finally came back through there, and he had a hole right where I thought I'd hit him. He jumped the string on me is what he did. But I hunted a weather change on that. It was the third day of bow season. I was the only person probably hunting anywhere in the woods that day. It was a low-pressure, foggy, slow, rainy day. And I said this on the other one. I'll say it on this one. That's another thing you can look for in early season is that weather change. It doesn't have to be a cold front. It's just if you've got if you've got six, seven, ten days of stagnant weather where it's just terrible, it's hot, and nobody wants to be out, and the deer aren't really moving that much. You don't think they're moving that much, but you've had not good, but you had negative weather for that long, and then all of a sudden you just get a weather change. I'll be in the tree, and that's what happened that day. I went in there. It was the third day of bow season. That's been a few years ago, but unfortunately, I didn't even come my, come home with a deer, but. I hunted that 14, gosh, I don't know, was it three years I hunted that deer? Yeah. I had two sheds off the thing, and one year I didn't even get him on camera. That's the year I found the sheds off of him. That's okay. how I knew he was alive. Yeah. And when I saw him, it was like I finally laid eyes on this joker. It was 11 o'clock in the morning and it was raining. No way. It's late. Came in sneezing. He was sneezing. If you've heard a buck sneeze. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's the nasal lots in their nose that are trying to – Make room around and breathe or what, but they, he, I've heard him sneeze, but I've heard lots of mature bucks do that. I knew what it was when I heard it. Yeah. Turn around, look behind me, and there he was, standing in the rain. Shoot. Big old 14 point. Oh, my goodness. As I'm watching him, I look down, and there's a 12 point. Didn't even know he came in on me. He's horning a bush 18 steps below me. <laughs> oh, my. About an 18-inch wide 12 point. Wow. And I got to looking at him while I'm sitting there in the stand. I was like, I got a shed off him, too. That year I found that matching set, I had one off him because his bean curved real hard. I was like, I've got a shed off that deer. But anyway, I shot at the 12 first and then the 14. I didn't have a camera out because it was all moist and raining, so I was trying to do it on my iPhone. I couldn't get it turned on. <laughs> but I did, film, difficulties. I, I did film the one at 2 o'clock, though, on my phone. It just quit raining. And uh, I did stick an arrow in him, but like I said, he jumped the string on me. I've got that one on YouTube. You can see it on there, but. That's all it took, though, was that weather change. Yeah. And there were some scrapes in there. And that big buck had worked those scrapes every year early. That big 14. He had worked those scrapes. He had twisted those bushes. That's where I had him on camera. Every time I had him on camera, about 20 yards from those scrapes. Man, that's crazy. Yep. Man, that's but he was elusive. He was just one of those deer. Yeah. It's hard to get on. Did you talk about your philosophy, kind of like high, low, morning, evening? Yeah, basically – those places I like to hunt and used to hunt a lot is above some kind of a funnel or a gap. 
and you've got those drains running up. And they kind of have they kind of play out, and there'll be a bowl area in there. And a lot of times, those does they'll be going up and down those ridges, but the bucks they'll they'll cruise in those little low spots up and down, up and down. They go around the hill, and they're just catching those thermals as they're coming up in the mornings. Whenever the sun comes up and heats the ground up, and things start pulling, they can pretty much use that to their advantage. To they're really not using it for safety at that point. They're kind of just looking for other deer, or looking for a doe that's in heat. Mm-hmm. I mean, they'll still play the wind to their advantage, but that's mainly what they're doing. Like I said before, it's kind of like cruising a bedding area. Yeah. And then the evenings, it's of course just the opposite. Sometimes on the north slopes and the cooler slopes, you'll have that down pull of the thermals way on up in the morning, depending on what the shading is and how cool it is in there. Like I said, you get those bubbles, you'll figure out lots of things. Yeah, I bet you learn what's a lot going. From yeah, watching that. You don't have any idea until you start, you know, seeing what those do. I used them so many years, though, I'd, I'm pretty confident now. You know, I kind of know how the deer are going to travel. And you can be in these spots, though. These You can find the best spot in the world, but you still have to go in there and have confidence and spend the time to kill these deer. Mm-hmm. It takes time. I mean, you can get lucky. You can go in there and kill the thing first couple of days but going in there not seeing him and knowing i haven't spooked him like that is almost just as good because i know eventually i'm, I'm getting closer if i hadn't seen him and he hadn't showed you know statistically clo- statistically it's <laughs> he's gonna show up eventually and right? when he does and when he does i feel like i'm in the kill tree yeah but that's where the confidence comes in right there yeah but it's hard to have because like i said these deer they're bad, elusive. Yeah, and they're hard to find. Hard to find. Hard on to those find. thermals, are you hunting, you know, early morning, you're hunting higher up on the mountain. <laughs> As it gets later in the evening, you're more comfortable getting lower, all that I'll kind of still, stuff. I'll still hunt high. I'll just, a lot of times, if I'm hunting a scrape, even in the morning, early, if I'm on one of those places where it's cooler, I'll mm-hmm. be below that scrape because they, they'll still be going down. Okay. And and the more of the pre-rut time, when they're traveling and cruising, that's when them little heads of those you know, drains that come up and make those bowls and these little hub-type places, that's when those are a little better. But if I'm actually trying to hunt a scrape, a lot of times I'll get below it. Okay. I'll be below it. I'll be downhill from it. Unless the train or something just causes me to be above it that allows me to get a better shot or something. Yeah, that kind of forces your hand a little forces bit. Forces me to do it. But if you're below them, especially in the evenings, I do most of my, a lot of my scrape hunting, a lot of my early season hunting's in the evenings. So that's why I'm under them. That's why I'm below them. Gotcha. I'm hunting on the downhill side of them. Yeah. And a lot of times I won't even be in range of them. I won't even set up where I can shoot the scrape. If I'm pretty confident, I know where he's going to be. And if, it, if if he's a mature deer, I'm like, I want to hunt where I can shoot this scrape, but I know better. But I've killed I've killed some big bucks way above too and uh when i told you the the rut kind of used to happen a little earlier i killed a really big 10 point one time and i got him daylighting on a scrape this thing was old and he'd even went downhill he used to be a bigger buck than what he was mm-hmm. and i was like well, i'm still killing him he's just a tremendously old deer couldn't figure out i was like man i've got that picture of him down there and he worked that scrape is it 9 30 in the morning so i got to looking up above where this point came down intersected the bench and uh, it was kind of a backbone point it wasn't really i wouldn't define it as an exact backbone point it was not real long but it was kind of narrow and flat but anyway i went up there and i found some sign right up on just on the break where you come over the hill where it tops out on that top bench he was coming around that point and crossing that point and there was some twisted sign there i got in there and set up there maybe hunted it I fixed up a place up in the ground. I just took a bunch of stems and stuff around my tree where I was sitting where I could cover myself. Yeah. He came walking in behind me at like 15 feet. That mature buck did. I shot him with a muzzle loader, but <clears throat> I wouldn't kill him if I hadn't been up there. Yeah. But that was a mid-morning type deal, and that's when he was coming through there was mid-morning. But I've had some other hunts where it's been like that where I've been above, but it is more of a pre-rut rut type thing when I hunt those places. Gotcha. So we've covered... Food, number one, we've covered scrapes, terrain, seasons kind of mixed in there. Uh, we just covered thermals. And the next thing we, we had talked about before was high scoring spots. What do you mean by that? And how does that play into your strategy? Okay, a high scoring spot, just for an example, 
one spot I've got. It's a big flat that comes out, and it's one of those pre rut spots. And I'm looking for those compounding features. I've got a timber change. I've got two timber changes there. I've got where it breaks into cedar, and I've got where it changes kind of from red oak, black oak to white oak. Okay. And then there's a drain that comes up and to a contour break right there. Two ridges on both sides of that drain. So there's several things right there coming together that would tell you that, okay, that's this is a spot that multiple deer are going to be using the right time of year, especially if there's food in here. And when there's food in there, they do use it. And back several years ago, before CWD really got bad and impacted them in there, I had so many bucks hitting that scrape under this one cedar tree. It was unreal. And killed a couple big bucks in there. Both of them, I killed both of them a bow. They were over 19 inches wide, both of them. Wow. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, after that, it kind of started going downhill with CWD, but there wasn't as many deer coming through there because of that. But I started making my own scrape there, and it got hot again. But it was one of those places that it scored pretty high, and especially after you add the food in there. Yeah. So you got those features that I was talking about. Well, if you've got, you know, oak trees that are dropping in there, that's another thing. There's a big thicket there, too, I forgot to mention. Okay. That I have to walk through to get in there. It's almost a cut over. It's just nasty. And uh, they bed in that, and then they bed off in the rough below there, too. So they've got bedding up and down from this place. They can bed under, and they can bed above. <clears throat> when it gets uh, cooler in uh, November and December, or in November, they can bed in the more open stuff up there where the sun's hitting. And then early season, they can bed below or in the pre rut when the leaves are still on if it's warm. But you got beach in there too. There's And if they hit, you just got another factor that plays into yeah. it. So, so you're down just, in those drains. You're scoring this spot and you're saying one plus one plus one mm -hmm. plus one. Like all of a sudden, yep. this is looking like a really, really great spot. Yep. And it's not it's not a good real early, early, early season spot. It's better. I've killed deer in there. Like, I've seen deer in there, good bucks, mid-October to all the way up through November. But usually not in that September time period or like when we open now. Right. It takes a little bit longer. It's more of the, one of those places where they start expanding. And I've had bucks come through that particular spot that I've had on camera, I would say at least five miles away. No way. Yep. Wow. Other bucks. Yeah. One for sure, it was actually probably maybe even more than, by the way, a deer would travel probably more than five miles. Golly. Yep. And multiple times. You And you're saying that because you've seen this deer other places? Yeah. On, you have it on camera? Yeah, I was clear. I was, you know, three mountains over. Had the same deer. Wow. Man. I think you're really hitting on something too with a high scoring spot because I I talked to so many kind of new deer hunters who they go out and they just sit in the woods <laughs> and it's like no shame that's I mean, that's how you're gonna learn it's gonna figure it out but I remember I I got frustrated even trying to figure out how to get big deer and before I was getting honed in on it feeling like if I don't have a really good reason to be in this spot I have n I have no reason to sit here mm -hmm. other than Maybe I like it and it's pretty and it may be some good vantage points. And we've talked about that before, Kyle, too, of like, why would I sit here if I didn't know Yeah, because at least something was going to happen right. or those potentially guys, would happen. Yeah, a lot of those guys go out there and do that, kill the 150. That's true. You're right. <laughs> yeah. You, all, you always got the beginner's luck, guys, right? You roll in. But mm -hmm. the high scoring spot is saying the train's in your favor. The season is right for it. You may You already have some sign. You know that there's food sources. You know that at least how you play it with the way you can get in, the way the thermals may be working, all of that kind of stuff. You're putting enough factors together to not, I mean, ever guarantee something, but you're going, man, my odds are way higher here than it was if I was just way, going way more sit, in your favor. Sit in a tree. Way more yeah. in your favor. Now that's big. I, I think the, and I like the high scoring spot yep. idea because it's, and it's then making you, you think like a deer yeah, hunter. Yep. Yeah. And then you want to go past that, you know, implement the scent too. Add For sure. that to it. And that can, that can increase your odds too. Yeah, that's not really uh, adding up to the score of that spot, but that's just one more thing. Yeah, to could put help. The odds in your favor. Could help get some deer scent. It's, it's for big them time with bow hunting. It's big time with bow hunting. Mm -hmm. Rifle hunting, you know, you can back off a little bit and 
get by with a little bit more. But even when yeah, I rifle hunt there. now, because I film, I set up in the same places I'm on bow hunt just because I'm filming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You That's the reason why I do that. And you'll see some of them I've killed. I mean, that one big one I killed last year, I shot him like 25 yards with yeah. a rifle. I mean, I could have killed him with a bow. But yeah. I was having trouble with my shoulders then, too. I struggled all year, and I thought, well, I can shoot a bow, but I better play it safe. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, you're talking about bow hunting, have to have to get him in close. Do you, I'm curious what your uh, kind of philosophy on calling is in, in the Ozarks. Um, how much do you use that? I've tried it a lot, but I don't use it much now because I've not seen it be too effective. Rattling that way, rattling anyway. Okay. But the old can call, when that thing first came out, man, I I could have them things at the base of my tree 80% of the time. <laughs> that the bleat call you're yeah. talking about that you flip over? <laughs> worked awesome. It worked it so good. And then it was like, I used it for four or five years, and all of a sudden, I don't know. I don't know. It just it all of a sudden didn't work as good. <laughs> they figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, I'll grind at them and uh, bleat. Yeah. And it seems to work, you know, pretty good. Depends on the deer and his demeanor and his attitude and all that. But, yeah, I wouldn't get too carried away with the rattling. I've got a buddy, you know, he he does a lot of rattling. Mm-hmm. And he rattles, you know, quite a few bucks in. Here in the Ozarks? Yes. Yeah, not far from here. I mean, he does a lot of rattling. But he hunts the Midwest a lot too. Okay. And so he's got confidence in it from just doing it out there. Yeah. But I've done it out there and it's – I mean, a dead gum, eighteen month old buck will bristle up out there. You rattle at him, and he'll come in there and check it out. I don't know what it is. It's just there's different. But I've heard that before, it, and from other other people who we've talked to, is just the um, there doesn't seem to be the same amount of people. Well, one people here who have the confidence in that. You hear a lot of guys out in the Midwest using rattles and stuff like that. Um, it just doesn't seem like that is as effective of, of a strategy here. And more times than not, and, and I feel this myself, I feel like I'm scaring more deer than I am actually bringing them in. <laughs> like, yeah. they're like, what the heck was that over there? And yep. it just doesn't sound realistic for whatever yeah. reason. I listened to the guy on your, I don't know if it was the last podcast you did, but the one I was telling you about, he was talking about how he heard people in the woods. You know, it's like, I know that's somebody rattling. Yeah, yeah, resting. <laughs> that's, that's, I think that's a big part of it, too. Yeah. It's like, man, that's not real. Right. And those, I think mountain bucks may catch on to that. Yeah. Because I've heard the same thing he was talking about. Right. Be sitting in my stand, somebody come in, and behind me, oh, my gosh. <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> yeah. It's like, man, I don't know. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but I highly doubt they will. But you do grunt, and you do throw a bleed out every now and then. Will you blind call, or yeah. do you kind of wait until you see a buck coming in and you try to yeah. put him on that leash? I'm in a pretty thick place. I think that with the calling, with that, you don't need to be in the wide open. I like to hunt by lay down. I like to hunt where there's a terrain drop something where they can't look and see they have to have a question in their mind mm-hmm. that um, i can't see that deer you know mm-hmm. you don't want a big buck looking from 80 yards where you can't see him down to where you're calling no. going you're nah, done. Yeah. There ain't no deer there yeah <laughs> you do that you're already done yeah it's you yeah you're not killing him but yeah on the i've called him up in places like that. i'll be on the side of a ridge where it really drops off hard and then he may come up through that bowl you know and he can't see down there because it just slopes off, you know, mm-hmm. and then I'll call, and I've called them up like that, or a big tree, or a bunch of trees, or in that beach I was telling you about where it's thick, I've had luck calling them up in that, I mean, they'll come right to your tree, because they can't see, mm-hmm. or try to circle and go downwind a lot of times, Yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, the grunting, and the bleating, and no specific sequence, just basically see them, and hit them with it, and See how they react to it. I like to call when they're moving. I don't like to call when they're standing still. Mm-hmm. When there's movement, when he moves that head, that's when I'll blow that grunt call. Yeah, make him try or to figure start it out. Starting to walk, starting to walk. I don't want him sitting there scanning, you know, and looking around, and then all of a sudden, right. Mm-hmm. I like him to be moving a little bit. That way it kind of gives him a little bit of question in his mind. Yeah. On exactly where did I hear this, you know. Right. I know pretty close, but they were pretty good at pinpointing, you know, like a turkey. But, yeah. But that gives them a little bit of – it might add a little bit more realism to it, and it gives him a little bit of question in his mind of where exactly he heard that come from. He knows the direction, but he doesn't know exactly. Because if you blow that thing and he's just standing there looking, I mean, he might even be able to tell that you're off the ground. Yeah, he's like, wait a second, yeah. something's not right over there. Mm-hmm. My dad has a story of public land hunting, and he blew a grunt, and there was a deer that was 
I don't know, 80, 90 yards away. And he said it turned and ran right at Young Buck ran right at him to the base of the tree and looked up at him. <laughs> like, what the heck was that? <laughs> Just trying to figure him out. But that sounds like one of those Midwestern dudes. Yeah, yeah. He said it was weird. So well, if we just hit seven, what about some essential gear for Ozark mountain buck hunting that you're going, man, it's a non-negotiable, I'm going to have this with me, whether it be stand, uh, clothes, boots, you name it, what are you taking? Kind of just depends on if it's an all-day set or if it's just an evening deal or kind of what I'm going in there to do. If it's an all-day set, I'm taking a backpack. And a lot of times I'll take a backpack when I'm going in scouting too or if I'm going to scout after a hunt because I have trail cameras in my backpack. I'll it. It'll have a lot of weight to it when I go in there because mm-hmm. that's how you find them, you know. Take your cameras when you go. You might get in there and wish you had one, you know. Mm-hmm. Find a place. I think I talked about this, too, on the last one. I'll make scrapes a lot of times when I don't have a camera and go back and look for tracks in it just if you don't have enough cameras to run. That right there can be just as good as having a picture of one. You see a big buck track, well, mm. then go get your camera and hang on mm-hmm. it. Gotcha. But, uh, yeah, I carry those in a backpack and uh, – of course, I'll take water if it's an all-day set. I'll take me a little scent spray. If I got something I got some confidence in, I get to sweat in a little bit, I might want to spray down. And, uh, of course, rope, pull-up rope. A lot of times I'll quarter my deer up when I'm back in there hunting. If I'm in a steep or in a rough place, I'm not going to drag them out of there. There's no way. I was going to say I have taken horses in and got them out before. Have you? Yeah. I was going to say some of these places that you're talking about getting back into – I just I can't even imagine pulling a deer out of there, you know, or at least dragging it out of there. Um, I've been places where it's I wasn't like far country off. Hunting. Yeah, I wasn't far off the road and I couldn't get the deer out hardly a <laughs> steep. But I've killed them, you know, close to the road, and I've killed them over a mile off the road. It's just different. I mean, just you got to find where they're at. But yeah, I'll carry that stuff and a knife. I got to have a knife. Of course, to with yeah, have to. Got to have that thing. Outdoor edge, I've cut myself. I don't know how many times with those things. <laughs> yeah, the little replaceable blades. Yeah, yeah. I'll carry rubber gloves just to keep things clean so I don't get blood all over everything. That way I can go back and hunt the next day and not have to worry about having blood all over my stuff. It may not matter that much, but <clears throat> it just helps keep things cleaner. And some bags, I carry bags too in case I do quarter them up and take them out. And then... I can't carry just everything I want to because you got this camera gear for mm-hmm. filming. Yeah, and yeah, that's an man, added that's thing a challenge for you that you're taking. That's the that's a challenge for me. It's uh, I don't know if you're having to carry a stand and that stuff. Yeah, it's pretty miserable. Mm-hmm. A lot of times I'll go in. I like to have my stand already hung before I go in there. I tried to do that last year in a spot, and there was some huge sign in there. And I knew it was going to be a hanging hunt deal. I got in there, and I was sweating so much, and I was so wore out by the time I got in there, I just pulled the plug on the whole thing Yeah, and went and hunt on the ground. <laughs> I was like, and because the only tree I could hang in was humongous, and I could not even, it was hard for me to even get a strap around it. Yeah. So I was like, man. You just pulled the plug. I pulled the plug on it. So, I, I mean, I don't know. When I killed that deer the other day, I was traveling light. I didn't have a backpack or anything because I don't want to carry one on my shoulder now and have that weight pulling down. Mm-hmm. So I I went in there with a pair of bib overalls, and I had every pocket just crammed full. I had a thermosel, I had rope, I had my tree stand strapped, <laughs> the straps to the tree. I had I had a thing of deer sin. I didn't put it out. I had my pocket. I was going to put it in the scrape if I didn't kill one that evening and then leave and then come back and check the camera, but didn't have to. I killed the buck. But, uh, yeah, I had my pockets just full. had cell phone. I think I even had a water in one of my pockets. But, yeah, I barely got in that tree. Yeah. So I like the marshmallow man trying to <laughs> climb that thing. You like Santa with his sack and he's pulling yeah. all the toys up the tree. Yep, that's about what it looked like. <laughs> so talk to me then about, it sounds like, uh, you know, you've got your gear. What What about kind of shifting topics a little bit to more about, like, mindset? I know on our list we kind of got two other things in mind that we've talked about, but just in terms of, attitude and like controlling what you can control as a hunter um how important is that to just have that mindset when you're approaching these tough deer to hunt that are not like hunting the midwest deer in kansas scent control and then being stealthy going in and then hunting that wind to your advantage like on those contour breaks i get a lot of confidence when i'm in places like that because i know it's a place where that big deer is going to travel and i know he's probably not going to smell me 
and he's feeling safe when he's traveling it. So there's a lot of confidence involved in that right there. It's like, because if you're sitting there and you're wondering the whole time, like, my scent is laying down on the ground, and if he comes from that way, it's going to drill him right in the nose. Mm -hmm. That makes you a little uneasy. You're like, gosh, all this time and effort, and what if he comes up here and smells me? Yeah. But if if you can play that right, and there's scenarios where you can up here on the, in these mountains, you can you can basically the scent goes right over the top of them. That's why I like to say I like to hunt when that wind picks up a little bit, and I can get that you know, seven to 10 mile an hour wind. A lot of people say, oh, they won't move when the wind's blowing like that. I've seen so many big bucks move when that wind's blowing. They will get up and move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's that consistent <laughs> wind that you're kind of waiting for to, to be able to Consistent wind, and when I'm hunting those scent. contour breaks and they're traveling around them, if I can find where they're coming up or I can get, a, it can be up above them, you're so high, you're adding that much elevation to what you already are in that tree. Right. And they don't smell you very often. Even when the thermals are pulling down, it, they don't smell you because it's usually your scent's already out there. Now, if it's dead still and there's no wind at all and it's coming down and then it sort of drifts downhill, he might get you then. But if you got enough to keep the leaves moving and it's – I've I fooled a lot of them like that. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of confidence. I killed a really big one one time like that, and I was hunting him on a scrape, and he was a big old wide deer. And I tried to kill him early season and never could get on him, and I ended up shooting a bear. I was actually on him good, could have killed him, but I shot, shot the bear, and it ruined the whole thing, and it blew him out. And I found him in muzzleload season, bedding in a pine stand, spooked him then, and it got really bad. He disappeared on me, found him on the other side of the mountain in early November, and he was hitting this scrape, him in a 10-point. But he was coming from that pine stand just on the other side of it. He was bedding this real thick pine stand, and he was coming off the side of this ridge coming down working that scrape. I couldn't get off that scrape. I had daytime pictures of that deer hitting that scrape over and over. I mean, I don't know how many mornings, a few mornings, always around 7.30 to 8 o'clock. I'd go sit in that tree. He wouldn't show up. I'd sit in it. wouldn't show. I wouldn't be there. He'd show. So... I thought, that thing's got to be smelling me. Something's, you know, something's up. Well, I was sitting there on a foggy morning, one morning, and a big 10 point, the one that was hitting that scrape, he pinned a doe down on that contour break below me, out of range of that scrape almost. But that got me to move down the hill. I thought, I'm moving down there, and I'm putting in a scrape. I'm going to put in a mock scrape down there just for a confidence builder. The bench that that scrape was on had a bunch of trees down on it, and I thought, well, he probably won't walk through those, but if he goes around them, he'll get down there on that break and then go hit the backbone, either go down or go around the mountain. That's exactly what he did. The very next time I went in there, he came right off the side of that ridge after I had moved down, worked that scrape, 7.45 in the morning, turns, comes right to me, gets on that break. No way. Boom, shot him oh, man. with a bow. But uh, never would have killed him, I don't think, if I hadn't actually moved. Cause yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he was smelling me. That's the only thing I can figure. You kind of have to think so. Yep. But he was a really old, mature, smart mountain deer. Well, that's a really good example of taking something that you can control into account when hunting a big deer. Yep. You found him. Everything we've already covered is working in your favor. You're just not seeing him. And then you finally see him. And you're like, well, I'll just move the 30 yards or whatever it is to get down yep. there. And now all of a sudden you're in the game. Yep. And, and you're able to kill that buck. I tried to cut limbs where I could squat and shoot that scrape at 55 yards or it may have been more than that. I was like, just in case, you know, because <laughs> I may not get to see him. But you never know, twice. yeah. But I couldn't have shot it there. I had too much arc. It would have thong, hit the brush and yeah, gone off. I was just sitting there watching him. He said, please come down the hill. And man, he turns. I thought, surely he's not going to walk through those lay downs, and he didn't. They just funneled him right down to me. But, again, he got down there in that positive. He wanted to go to that positive terrain. Even though it was thick, it would have been hard for him to go through those trees. He went, scaled the edge of them, and then went right down to me and got on that break. He was already starting to turn when I shot him. He wasn't coming at me. He'd already started to turn and go around. And like I said, he could have either went down that backbone or just went on around that contour break once he got past me. I don't know what he would have done, but 
when I shot him, he just went around there about 40 yards and started wobbling and fell over. So I don't know exactly where. That's all she wrote? That's all. Well, uh, not exactly. I got up there. It was real windy. The wind was blowing like 12 miles an hour. And uh, blood was pouring out everywhere. I thought, he's dead. I slipped up there, and that thing was still alive. Oh, hey. Yeah, he got up on his feet, stood there, and looked around for a second. And then he fell back over with his belly facing me. I was like, I've been there and done this. I'm sending another one through him. So I shot him up through the chest. And he flipped around and rolled and got up and jumped straight up in the air and went about six feet in the air and went over a dang bluff and went down and skidded down the hill probably, I don't know, 80 to 90 yards down the hill. No way. Kicking and flopping. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> Mountain deer. That is crazy. Very tough. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, he went wild. And then when I got down there, even after I'd shot him up through the lungs like that, I grabbed a hold of his horns, and he just went to shaking his head still. I was like, this is unbelievable. Oh, my gosh. That's a wily old mountain bike. It was. It really is. It was. But he, yeah, after that, when he went up in the air, he went, it was just like whew, straight down. <laughs> gosh. I had to have Dad come help me get that one out, too. I bet He you kept did. making comments. He's like, man, you have to quit shooting them in these places. I said, well, that's where you got to kill them. <laughs> that's where the big ones are. That's where you got to go to kill them. I think number 10 should be a layup. It's uh, how does confidence play into killing big bucks? Because the average fella hunting big mountain deer doesn't have much confidence, <laughs> I imagine, in their setup or in their hunt or pursuit as a whole. It's I may run into one every few seasons. I may get lucky. It may be awesome. But for the most part, and maybe I'm speaking just to myself. As tough as they are, confidence. I still question myself. I yeah. Mean, even if – because it is. I mean – and. Yeah, I mean, the wind, with what I just talked about, that's confidence. And then going in there and knowing that you're as scent free as you can possibly be, that's confidence. Mm -hmm. Going in there and not traveling through the area that he, you think he's going to be coming to you. Don't walk across where you think he's going to cross or a path he's going to walk. When you go into that stand, that gives you some confidence to know that, all right, he's not going to pick me off if I mm -hmm. touch a bush or if I leave sand on something. And then just being in that kill tree, it's – that one's hard, though, because, I mean, this is big country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of trees. Yeah. And Picking the right one is the hard one. I've still got places I hunt, though. It's I've got that, you know, uneasy feeling like, oh, well, what if this happens? What if he comes up over here? Well, he could come down here. But then the other thing that can give you confidence is what I said earlier. When you get in there and you, you set, you find that spot on the map, you do get in the tree and you observe, and you see multiple bucks or you see – how they're traveling or how they're using that terrain. And then that adds a lot of confidence once you make that adjustment. If you're close enough to see that, but you got to be close enough to see it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that right there, will, that's big confidence when you can find a situation like that where you, you know, are close enough to see where you need to make the adjustment. But then you have to be, you know, where you feel like you can, hunt where it can be a decent win for him. He can feel comfortable traveling through there, but yet you not get busted too. It goes back to just making all those, putting every odd in your favor that you can. Yeah. Practicing the scent control, trying to make it go above his head, hunting when that wind's blowing a little bit. And I like it blowing more than a little bit, but like I said, seven to six, seven, eight, ten, somewhere around through there. A lot of times it needs to be more than that if you're hunting lower on the mountain because it won't be catching the wind like it will be on the side of the ridge or on top. Because so it's protected down in there. That's why I like everybody, oh, that wind's blowing 15 miles an hour today. Well, go where it's not blowing 15 miles an hour, and you can use it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to do. Because, I mean, those deer, it's another world down there uh, in that on that other facing slope. Where he's down there, and it might not be the side of the mountain where the wind's hitting, and it may be, you know, five miles an hour down there. It may be a perfect time to hunt. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think confidence, too, is just time equal in the woods. I mean, at the end of the day, there's that's it. There's so much confidence you can build just by being in the game. It's just like bass fishing in yeah. tournaments. Who wins the tournaments? The people that spend the most time on the water. People that fish, mm -hmm. yeah. That's who wins the bass tournaments. That's who kills the big deer. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's a lot of good – mountain hunters up here that have done it for years and take advice off of them too people that'll tell you you know what they know right because there's a lot of people that they know different you know there's there's more than one way to do it there's always things that are overlooked so never 
never, ever, ever think that you have got it completely dialed in. Of course, you can come out here and hunt for a week, and you'll it doesn't take long. You, <laughs> you're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not completely dialed in. Yeah, you lose that confidence. Well, mm-hmm. that's that's the thing about it that is so. I mean, it's why we love doing stuff like this. We're getting to talk to people who everyone, like you said, has a different philosophy, and so so to kind of take what you've learned from your experience being in the woods and now combine that with what you're talking about, what Kyle's talking about, what somebody else we talk with is talking about and kind of combine all those factors together. That's what it kind of takes to have that confidence. Cause if you don't have it, there's nothing worse than, you know, you go out, you're sitting in a tree and you just feel like I'm in the wrong spot. I shouldn't be here. Like you just don't want to sit as long when you don't mm-hmm. have that confidence So you might not hunt as hard. You might get distracted. You're on your phone. Mm -hmm. You're not locked in. You're not paying attention. And you could you could goof things up. And you could climb down too early. You could bump a deer. I mean, I'll add one more thing. Okay, there's I know I'm forgetting stuff, but to the confidence thing, and that's the lunar tables. Okay, pay close attention to them. Not every deer will pattern themselves to them and actually move exactly with them, but it's man, it's it's accurate a lot of the time, especially on some of these mature deer, but it kind of plays into the actual scenario or situation that you got. If you're hunting way off, if it's early season and you're hunting a buck's core area and you're off of it and you're planning on hunting, oh, it's the moon's right and everything's going to be good. But if you're not within that zone or in that bubble, it ain't going to matter what the moon is. Mm. But if they're in transit, then you may have a better chance. You better be out there on those good lunar tables. When you say, just for someone who doesn't know, like when you say the moon's right or, the you know, watching the lunar tables, what are you looking for? I like a rising moon, like a moon overhead, and you can kind of play it too. Like if the moon's overhead at night, you got all kinds of night activity going on. It's, I mean, you can see it on trail camera. Mm-hmm. It'll be when that moon's high. It's just like, you know, everything's illuminated and things are moving. Well, that next day, you know... They're going to lay up and almost sleep in. But 10.45, 11.45, noon, that's a lot of times when you'll catch these things, just boom, middle of the day all of a sudden, a random picture in a scrape, you got a big buck working it. That's when you'll pick a lot of those pictures up. Yeah. When you got them where they move all night like that. Mm. That's just one scenario that I've seen with cameras and out hunting. But uh, in the evenings, if that moon's coming up in the evenings, and I know it's going to be right at prime time when that moon comes up, and you've got weather to go with it, man, that's you better be in the tree that you day. Better be out there. Yeah, I've got so many hunts like that in the evening where I've seen bucks. Of course, you still got to be in the right place, but if you're in those places where, like I said, they're going to expand and they're in transit, then it may not matter. You may pick up a buck coming from who knows where. If the food's right sure. and the conditions and the, everything lines up, but yeah, I'd add that to it. The moon, pay close attention to it. You can go to a website. It's best times to hunt dot net. It's the, it's the eleven commandments now. It's the eleven. Becky <laughs> broken ten. <laughs> oh, I, just, uh, yeah, I, I told love you it. before. I told you before there'll be all kinds of. Oh, there's, there's so many dynamics. There's so much to this. There's so much. I mean, you could tell as we were going through the episode, we tried to put like some some order to it, but there's so much. There's so much. So many factors yep. that kind of weave their way into all of it, and and even like as we were talking about seasons, it's like, okay, we'll consider the calling, but also think about when you're calling and, you know, what food sources are around and what terrain you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Is it wide open? Is it tight? Should you be calling loud, soft? Mm -hmm. Like there's so many things. So it really is kind of hard to, to put a 10 commandment list to it, but it's a massive puzzle to put together. We did our best, didn't we? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, we did our best. I think at the end of the fun. day, get in the woods. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, go figure spend it out. Spend time, experiment. Mm-hmm. Spend time in the woods. The more time you can spend in there, the more you'll learn. Absolutely. And then there your confidence will follow that.